Hello and welcome to the bottom of it with your host Joshua Moriarty. How you doing out there? Thank you for joining me, Joshua Moriarty, your host for another episode of The Bottom of It. Do you think we've been getting to the bottom of it? I feel like I have actually made some progress. I feel like I know a little bit more about so many wonderful artists and people that have joined me. It's been such a, a pleasure and an honor to have everybody come and spend their time with me and shoot the shit. I really, really thank you everybody who's been involved. It's, I, You know, look, you, you really are helping me get to the bottom of it. Now, I'm not going to say any more. I want to get straight into today's guest. We have the one and only Jamie Liddell. Now, he's an artist I've been a fan of for a long time. He released his debut, not, not his debut record. It's, it's probably, I guess it was, to me, I think of it as his debut record, Multiply, which came out in 2005. But he had an album before that called Mudlin Gear, which we discuss uh, in the interview, which was wild. It, it, I don't think he really sung anything sort of, uh, what's the word? What's the audio equivalent of legible? <laughs> it's, yeah, dec- decipherable. It's just kind of, it was a, a weird mash of, of sounds. But Multiply was his album that had a whole bunch of songs. It was a change of direction. That was in 2005. And I've been following his career ever since then. So if you know Jamie and you, you know his work, you know that he has one of the most remarkable voices, a voice that often has made me quite jealous. He, I was listening to Multiply the other day after the interview and I found myself pulling the like, ooh, dang, that shit's hot, stank face. Like, he's, he's got so much soul, so much character. It really, it kind of, it gets you. He's got a way of getting you. He, he pulls you in. Now, not only is he just an incredible singer, but he's also a brilliant songwriter and great with computer tech techniques lots of you know good with gear good with manipulating sounds he built his own looper he also has his own podcast called hanging out with audio files where he talks to other uh, artists musical engineers and producers all about recording techniques to get to excuse me techniques gadgets all those sorts of things yeah jamie's a, a man of many talents so he came over to the place in la he was out visiting los angeles he lives in nashville but he was out here working doing songwriting sessions he's been that's sort of a change in career that he's been doing recently so we sat down to discuss that his love of recording uh being a fan of prince obviously how we got started out in the 90s all sorts of things so here we go ladies and gentlemen jamie liddell enjoy I've been terrified of that happening. Especially, oh, yeah. yeah. It's good to have the backup. You, 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 yeah, you're, you're a little more understanding because you also host a podcast yourself, so you're going to be a little, yeah. little more gentle on me. Keep an uh, eye on things exactly. as well. Well, listen, <laughs> so that's, aren't right. That's some, when, how long ago did you start the podcast? It's getting on for a year almost, 23 episodes, so that's, you know, 46 weeks. Yeah. And I do them every two weeks because I just can't handle doing more I guess yeah um, but that's yeah. good you, you are and you're regularly doing them every two weeks I haven't missed a, I haven't missed a Monday since I started which good, is good. yeah I mean this one that just passed was definitely a ball ache I mean they're all a bit of a ball ache really because I always <laughs> and uh, invariably I don't know it's just kind of almost inevitable this will happen but I just leave it all to the last three days right you know what I mean it's just like oh better do the podcast and for me, I don't know how it's with you, with, with the nature of my show, it's because of this sort of so-called nitty-gritty section. Now, is that the bit at the... Which, which, I that's the tech segment at the beginning. Yeah, at the beginning, like, yeah, that's yeah. the bit I thought. But you didn't say, here's the nitty-gritty section, do you? I sort of do. Not on the Sean Everett one, that was the one that I listened to. Well, right. That was, the, I... that was the beginning, maybe, that was like episode six or something. There you go, I mean, I've just... It's not like I've got this hard and fast thing, but in a way... Actually, but you... It's I kind of like the episodic nature of things. Yeah. It sort of gives me a focus so I don't go crazy. So now I have a bit more of a, a sort of a Pro Tools template that was based around a show that I liked. You know, just mm. all the weird things that you have to think about, right? Of course. Just sort of like, so for my show, like it, I, I, like to, I do the intro preamble, then get into this sort of tech segment and the tech segment when I do them first of all I've got to think of a new one every two weeks which is fine for 46 weeks 
what I mean? And now I'm like, what else can I concoct? <laughs> yeah. Do you know what I mean? So, but I think partly just doing interviews with other musicians, now one of my things is like, you know, hey man, you've got any sort of weird ways that you like to work because maybe I can, you know, work that in somehow. So anyway. But you, I feel like you've always got some new <laughs> like, tr- like it sounds like you you love this stuff. You're yeah. always fiddling, twiddling. True. I mean, you know, I've got a lot of gear on the one hand, so it's almost like I can go into the studio and just look around and go, which box have I neglected? Yes. Like maybe there's something in this that was really cool. Maybe the reason I bought it in the first place. So usually, sort of, I try to not make it totally about I've got this gear. And it does this because it's a bit like exclusive in a way. Sure. Because so, at that point, it's just like listen to the way the MS20 sounds. If you don't have one, tough shit, you know. It's not <laughs> that great to do that. But at the same time, hopefully the techniques are a bit wider than that. But yeah, so that will take me a whole evening at least. To, typically, what will happen, if I, if I take my time, I'll spend say, a whole evening. So when I did this one with like lavalier mics on the end of drumsticks... Like and I didn't really know you what were talk- I was that doing. Was, you were sort of talking to Sean Everett about that, I, I think. When yeah, you, you guys said, mentioned it, putting the microphones on the end of the drumsticks. Did we talk about that? Yeah, yeah. And I don't know if either of you said that you'd done. He said, "Oh, that sounds like a great idea." I now thought I'm I gonna... asked him if he'd done contact mics on the end of the drumsticks. Oh, maybe, maybe it was if, that. Yeah, yeah, because I think I'd read that Blake Mills had done that, but I think it can't have been contact mics. It must have been labs. Because when I started doing it, I was like, oh, this is really makes a lot of sense. And then, funnily enough, someone made a comment like, oh, yeah, that's how we do the percussion in the orchestra. Right. Like, because that's how we mic it, because it's so tricky to do with spot mics or whatever. I don't know. So anyway, but now, say, for example, with that little thing, just to nerd out a little bit, like, you know, I'd, I'd be like, what do I do with these lav mics? See, what happened was I was recording a dude, and I, and I thought, I'm going to crack out the labs. Because I hate... Is that going from there? Yeah. It's playing in the background so that we... It's nice. Thank you. Yeah. Yeah. That's um, a little background. Doesn't you that know, make editing tricky? Nah, it doesn't matter. I don't really edit. Do you edit anything oh, in the podcast? Oh, I edit maybe a thousand cuts per episode. Right. I, I edit every single... Everything. <coughs> I edit everything. Like that stuff? Everything. But do you edit the con- know, content as in... I edit the content. I edit the... Not too much the content. More the flow. Okay. Some people, I don't know if you've noticed, they just, even like natural speech just has the weirdest flow sometimes. <laughs> and it's pretty off put sometimes with it. You know, it's no one's fault. It's just natural speech, actually, weirdly. I mean, I've gone through a few things, a few ways of doing it. I mean, just to finish the laugh thing before course, I, yeah, I, yeah. I'm a Mr. Tangents, but I was just going to say, like, I'll, I'll, I'll sit there with Labs. I was recording this thing with this dude. See, I'm, I'm doing it myself, see? It's okay. And I'm just giving you, like, tangential This, is, this is not getting edited. Oh, good. Well, I like it. <laughs> yeah, I mean, it is. This is natural. And then, um, yeah, so I'll, I was thinking, ah, see, I bought the Labs, much like yourself, to do podcasts. And I did do the Blake Mills and a couple of interviews with, with the Labs because it's nice, isn't it, to not have a physical thing in I, your that's face. That's why I've chosen yeah. it. Yeah, yeah. It just makes Larry it. Crane had, like, these ones on a table that kind of just... Directional Point. sort of ones. Quite right. nice. This sounded really good. Okay. Uh, that's another way of doing it, I guess. Um, but yeah, I just didn't like them. I think I got these Sankin ones and it's too good. It is too much <laughs> like condenser microphones. They okay. pick up so much ambience. It's just like off-putting to me. Um, so I thought, okay, I've spent loads of money on these labs. It's actually making You've got to do sad. something with them. Yes, yeah, so it's like, what can you do with them in the studio? So I thought, here's the most ridiculous idea. I'm going to put on kick. In the kick. Mm-hmm. See what it does. Sort of laughing to myself, like this is weird. this is stupid. <laughs> look at this mic. It's hilarious to look at it. Cause it's got the biggest drum and a teeny mic. That's like <laughs> it's just like almost the fear of the mic. Like don't do it. Don't hit the drum. Not on me. It's like cruel almost. The juxtaposition it sounded amazing. Right. It sounded this is the new trick. It sounded sick. I was just like, what? This is like. Does it sound good on like all the drums? And I thought, fuck, man, you can put this thing in a snare. You can put it in the hole, so, you know, because they've all got those breathing holes. So I just put yes. the lab in it. And I was like, what a crazy position. You can, you can have them in the snare. And you can use this sort of almost like scientific, almost analytic 
stop recording. Do you know what I mean? Experimental, mm -hmm. sort of almost uncomfortable. You know, almost well, to the point of end, you know, what do you call that when you put a thing in your body? Uh, do you know what I mean, endoscope. Uh, yeah. It's like an endoscope <laughs> of recording. It's like terrible, medical. But so anyway, I had such a good time just fucking around with all my drums, just going what. And then I thought it was purely just sort of fucking around. I thought well, I'm just going to um, gaff it to a uh, stick. Because okay. then, like, because I used to do shit with Christian Vogel when we did the Super Collider stuff. We'd have, we did all kinds of stuff like hold. I bought, I think, before at that time, like two really nice sort of Sheps condensers, and I would just. This is in the late 90s? Late 90s, early 2000s, yeah. yeah. And the two, it was probably about 2001. So I had like, I had two of these chips, and the cool thing about those, it's really hi fi mics or whatever. Sure. But again, I didn't quite know why I bought them. They were good value. So, and I knew that they'd be, they'd be fancy. It's a bit, and they're so detailed, it's almost weird. But anyway, so what we do, we put one out of phase with the other and hold them one in each hand. Mm -hmm. And we just like spin hi hats and just sort of put headphones on and smoke a bunch of weed and just be like, dude. <laughs> do you know what I mean? Just sort of like, just get lost in these weird phase holes and just kind of do that for a day, basically. And then chop it up and make weird samples. That's kind of how we did a lot of super colliders, getting really wasted and recording sounds for about a month, yes. chopping them up and then making a record with them. It's a really laborious way of doing things, but I love that. And so it kind of took me back to that time. This wasn't smoking, so I got it all done in an evening. <laughs> so uh, basically had two yeah, but, but as fun or not quite as fun? Still really fun, yeah. Still really fun. I, just, I, I think part of it is kind of like, because now I'm a dad, when that night time comes, my wife and son are in bed, I've got like to sort of rush to get everything done, essentially. Mm, I get course. started at 8 o'clock, I've got to push through, and I don't want to go past 12, really, otherwise I'll be knackered in the morning, and just be a bad dad. <laughs> so I try to just use those hours like to the max. I think if you use four hours to the max, you can, you can get plenty <laughs> done. You're absolutely right. Yeah. But I, when you have a plan... I mean, obviously, these sort of nitty-gritty sections, sometimes I'm just winging it. Like with the labs, I had no plans. I was just like, what else did it sound good on? And I was also accumulating a lot of audio, which I was like, oh, this is great, but who's going to edit this audio, Jamie? And I was like, yep, that'll be me. Just like physically going through half an hour of labs going, bam, ding, <laughs> bam. It's just like, that one or that one, you know, and then piecing that together and then making a meaningful story behind it and then explaining it. To be honest, that's the most intensive part of the whole show. Yeah, okay. The educational segment. I, I don't really enjoy having to do the intro and outros of my podcast. It's tricky, isn't it? The talking to yourself thing feels a little bit weird, yeah. It really does. Yeah. I think you just got, yeah, and I, it's true, I put it off, that's why I put it off to the very last I'm minute. I'm <laughs> saying. I start getting a bit weird and sort of think, oh, come on, it's being childish. I'm just like, yeah, blah, 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 I have to do this thing. Yeah. Okay, okay, okay. Radio voice. But it's, I think, I don't know if you've found it does get a bit easier, maybe. It's a little easier. I, think, it a I easier. think it's just accepting completely who you are. And well, it is. It's an element of self loathing. Removed. Yeah, that's, that's what it is. Yeah. I'm, if my joke is bad or I, if I stumble on a word or anything, yeah. I just kind of. I've criticised yeah. myself a little. I know, totally. A little I, mean, too it, much. It, I don't know. I mean, I've done. I do like really shoddy work in regards to framing the guests properly with proper respect. I'd usually just say things like, yeah, it was great to hang out with them. They're basically like a pal of mine, so anyway, I hope you enjoy these <laughs> It's like. That's it. It's like super lazy. Sometimes I'll even read shit off Wikipedia, you know, just because I think oh, yeah, of course. they've done a great job. We're all, yeah, yeah, we're all oh, punching so. stuff off Wikipedia. I can't, I can't do it better. So anyway, but yeah, well, thanks for asking about the show because it's definitely been, uh, you know, it's funny, isn't it? It's funny to do podcasts. I mean, what motivated you to start, man? Uh, I think... It's just so, it's, yeah, there's, there were so many people and friends that I wanted to pick their brains so much more intensely, but that you couldn't really do just as a friend because it would feel a little bit weird. Like, so I, Chris yeah. Taylor was one of the first ones that I did and I've known Chris a while. Um, we're better friends than we ever have been these days just because, you know, we've known each other longer now and have done a record together and all sorts and since he moved here. But before that, I knew him 
but I didn't know him well enough to kind of be able to go deep. So, totally, like, yeah. okay, why don't I sit you down for an hour and we make it official and then I can ask you every single thing that I ever wanted to. For sure, man. And I think that was, that's sort of the main reason for it. I don't really care about collaborating with people. I'm not really that interested in that. I'd rather just actually talk to them about what it is that they do. And that's, that's plenty for me. So selfish reasons. But <laughs> no, said, but look, I completely understand because I've been out here, talk about selfish reasons, selfishly pursuing this idea of me as a co-writer, which is something I'm really passionate about. So this, so lots of songwriting stuff. Yeah. With people. But that's your, just, your yeah. new kind of thing. Kind of has been for a while, but yeah, I, I, I really do enjoy it. I like, I think, you're, you're a great songwriter. You've written some amazing songs. Well, thank songs. you. I mean, <laughs> yeah, I, I'm yeah. trying to sort of share that, whatever I've kind of accumulated over the years. Mm-hmm. It's partly that. Oh, that sounds really sort of pretentious. It's not. No, it, it's it doesn't not, sound pretentious. It, yeah, but it sounds pretty egotistical. Well, really? you're English, so of course you have to say it. <laughs> <laughs> If you yeah. were American, you like, wouldn't hey, have man, it. I'm the shit. <laughs> Woo! Yeah, no, well, I guess. I mean, I was just going to say, like, I've been in sessions, even recently on this trip, where I thought, you know what, I'm not really enjoying this process. Okay. What would have been far better is just for me to interview you guys. Right. And I had that exact thought on a session. I was like, but it'd be really rude if I just cracked out my podcast gear and went, guys, can we just break up the flow? Maybe I'll interview you guys you know, for the rest of the day. And yeah, then I'll go home. sure. But, it, you, but you, is this with fresh young talent or with sort of people that are already established that it would have been, that could be on your podcast? Yeah, the latter, I think. Mm. Uh, just sometimes, I've, I've realized on this trip possibly it would happen like more easily if I was a little bit more of a veteran in the game I no, don't no. love doing co-writes when there's no artist in the room you yeah. know what I mean I don't know if I'm capable of just going like this song's going to be called like insatiable or something do you know what I mean it's like okay great there's a, um, let's go Savage Garden Darren Hayes has a song called Insatiable I feel like it was the first single after Savage Garden broke up that he went solo. It's pretty good, actually. Is it? Yes, but you, that's... Ex- it could such, have been written in that way. You know I mean? <laughs> it's such a like yeah. mod pop so, song. Like, pluck, you know. a, pluck a word out of... You yeah. Know, put out of the desire pool. You know what I mean? <laughs> Hungry. Just something like primal and, and you know. And then he, he ended up just sort of thinking, I'm a total cliche. This is like a total... I'm, I'm a joke. Do you know I mean? I'm just sort of like, I can easily sort of just think, oh, no, 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 no. I care too much. I mean, it, I, what I'm saying is, right now, mm-hmm. I still love music and, you know, the heavy shit that I'm into doesn't sell units. Let's put it like that. You know what I'm saying? Sure. And, but, like, and in a way, if you're going to be a co writer, just doing, like, stuff for, for musical pleasure, it might not pay the bills. Uh huh. And you've got a child now. Yeah, you know, you I'm th- serious. You have to think about the bills yeah, more. Yeah, you do. I it's mean, true, I, yeah. I, and and uh, oh, I'm saying it might not pay the bills. And if it doesn't pay the bills, why am I doing that and not concentrating on my solo career? Because mm-hmm. at least then I'm in control of all the parameters. I don't have to think, oh, maybe that song I cut on Wednesday won't be released. I don't have to talk to an A and R. I don't have to harass. You know, I don't have anything in the way of my solo career I don't have a label or anything I can just put out whatever I want whenever I want mm-hmm. and like at least then I'm the master of ceremonies as it were so anyway of course a lot of those songwriting sessions don't end up going anywhere I find that's right that's why I just stopped doing them a little bit I'll only do them if it's with someone that I really you know that I like or it's important and, then, and it's going towards something I yeah. feel like a lot of them people get together and they have this imaginary idea that, you know, it's going to make it to Beyonce or something when it's not going to make it to Beyonce. Just because you have a friend that knew a guy who did a session in <laughs> LA like two years ago, 
and then it ended up getting to Taylor Swift. There's a lot of those stories yeah, floating yeah, about. Sure. So everyone's thinking that some song that they write's got the chance, but really <sighs> they're all a bit stitched up. And I agree. I mean, for me right now, I just I think just the just as a writer, I just like doing it. Mm-hmm. I just like kind of like exercising that muscle in a way. Mm. So I'm all right right now. I'm not burnt out, but I feel like this month of writing even could push me towards cynicism and burnout, <laughs> you know, more than I was anticipating. Of course. So, but that's also really good to know. You know? Yeah, well, yeah, you know your threshold. Yeah, and so, so I know when I write in my studio in Nashville, I have a different set of possibilities. I can head towards production and like make that a part of the nature of the process. Mm-hmm. Whereas if I'm stuck at a laptop, it happened to me yesterday, I'm relatively powerless, I realize. I'm not one of those guys who can whip up a track on a laptop like super fast mm-hmm. in just a cold sort of like white room studio yeah like, with okay, that. go make a hit song I'm just I get paralysed actually I'm like oh shit uh, what do I even do how do you make music I'm cra- it's crazy I sort of lose all my superpowers and I <laughs> and, it, and it's interesting I mean I kind of like got my shit together yesterday I was doing a song and I just thought what am I doing I'm just staring at Ableton going how do you do a drum beat I mean do you know what I mean I was, it's literally <laughs> I, know, it's like, I, I know had too many mean, sounds yeah. and I was just like I'm wasting time. I was just like, I was like, wow, I'm really sort of panicking here. Like, what's fucking up? What's going on? But I think it's just, you know, I'm so used to, I got extremely used to my little world around me in Nashville. Well, you're, and, and I like that. To me, you're, you can be right, crazy, weird noises going all over the place, but then you also have just a very classic songwriter thing going on as as well yeah so i don't know how you reconcile those sometimes or you know like how do you choose which direction to go and into Uh, or i like i mean i must admit yeah it's almost on a day-to-day basis it changes it's funny like i was in yesterday with a young artist and uh they really wanted to hear production okay asap Whereas that my, takes you time, I imagine. Well, it well, takes everyone time to be able right. to make cool sounds. Especially because it's like it was a more of a pop session. So, you know, love it or hate it, that pop production is quite involved often, you know? Mm-hmm. Yeah, of course. So it's not the kind of thing that you can just pull out your ass in like literally an hour. Yeah, there'd you be can, some people who could do that. Definitely. But, yeah, but that's But they've not. probably got more big building blocks ready to go. Yeah, absolutely. Or sound palettes that are just like on that on that tip whereas yeah. I don't think like that they dial up the preset on the right. computer and it's ready to that's go that's what I'm saying about not being like yeah. prepared on the laptop too. if I was thinking I was going to do more of those sessions I would have a template probably mm-hmm. that's like of like these are the hot drums for now this is my these synth this is the, the br- you know I just have all my sounds ready to go um, so yeah I, I, I actually gravitate yesterday I was gravitating more towards Let's not get all excited about the production. Let's make sure we've got a song. There's a good keyboard player in a session, so I was like, this is great. Let's sit around the piano, you know? Let's make this song. But to be quite honest, it probably wasn't the right way to go. We should have, in retrospect, we probably should have built the track ASAP. Okay. Like, got the mood going and used that energy to excite the young mind and just kind of go, I can hear this being a song. Yeah, well, but, you, but you don't you don't know what what every no. person's going to be desiring, do you? It takes half a day. You know, it was cruel a little bit. We get in at one, uh, and then it's sort of like got until eight to do it all. We did it. We got the vocal in. We had the track. We had some ad libs. The whole song was done. Production, squint and sort of see it. Um, and it was squint your ears. Yeah, squint your ears. <laughs> to be honest, not sure it would ever make it into the final pack. But it was sort of like it, that's the thing. I, I think what's cruel about songwriting is if you do go down that road and you're committing to it, there's almost a sort of a cruel A and R part of your mind which is like this song just won't work. Mm-hmm. Do I just cut it off now? And just say, let's try another one. Or do you sort of 
see if you can follow through just for the sake of being professional in that way. So there's so many things I don't know how to do. Right but that, I think that's sort of a creative process uh, always is sometimes you've got to fight through and it, yeah. will, it will lead you somewhere whereas you just don't really, <laughs> you never really know, do you? I very, yeah, man. Yeah, I'm sure you've had varying degrees of success with that. There would have been some song of yours that was something else yeah. before and then you would kind of just keep going and then finally you get it and then it's brilliant. So definitely, you're right. I mean, some songs, remember that song, Little Bit of Feel Good was a good example of that. It's been a really successful song for me and I remember me and Mocky when we were making that it started out in LA actually and it was okay. it started out as like a night jam in Justin Stanley's studio I don't know if you know Justin Stanley no I don't know uh, great guy man you've got to get him go on. get him on the show oh, put dude. him on the list yeah obviously like really okay. awesome dude and uh, you know true feeler he's done a lot of heavy shit and like great musician to play with and just you know always sets a good vibe so we were like just chilling of an eve no click track uh-huh. just jamming on this thing and we were like I don't know if I... I can't remember if there was a song already. I think there might have been. And anyway, we had this thing. We were like, oh, man, that's the vibe. So like, let's do something on that. So we committed more and more stuff to it. And then later I was like, you know what? This thing speeds up like pretty nastily, man. And like it was, I guess, 2006, you know, seven. Yeah, the album's Gems 2008, yeah. right? So it, it was a cool time for technology, but it wasn't as easy to no, do different, time definitely. stretching and yeah. stuff. So Marky and I sat with that bastard and li- literally just chopped it into pieces. So the finished version that we hear on the record is from that session, but just <sighs> cut to pieces. Uh, like, yeah, I mean, <laughs> so much labour, like so much nudging tambourines to the point of insanity, like for days. Just like for that, da- I, I, I just remember days. It sounds so natural, that yeah. song. I would never but, well, have it's just like, it's like doing it as long as you can and remaining sane, walking away, huffing and puffing and going, this bastard song. And just going like, why, don't we, why are we doing this song? Like maybe we should just ditch this song. You could, man, you could have just restarted it. We could have restarted it. it. <laughs> we should have just done it again. But did you have the, the sound? the vibe. Yeah. something about yeah, it. Yeah. I'm glad we stuck with it, but it was a good lesson. Classic example of like, it was worth the toil. Like, in, in a modern mindset, like you say, I mean, you hear these stories of Brian Eno working with you too and just wanting to record over one of those songs in, right. in, in, When the Streets Have No Name or I can't remember which one it was. Okay. Yeah, one of those ones that he worked on. I think yes. He, did he even work on that one? Well, for the sake of the story, yeah, yeah he did, yeah. He just sort of, just would come in every morning and he said all it was was this doctoring job of trying to fix this thing and he was just like it would just go on for weeks or something it just got to the point where he's losing his actual mind <laughs> his actual mind so like uh, <laughs> he just said I think at one point just told like you know the other engineer to like hit record record over this right just, just like accidentally Do, lose this does this stuff so, get easier for you as the years go by mind losing do you sort of trust that if you just keep working you're going to get there. Do you ever feel like you've lost it or there's never going to be another good song? You go through this, all of these things every day. Yeah, I mean, I think what's harder for me and maybe one of the real motives for the co-writes is um, I find it harder for me to write songs currently and it, it's always a phase. It's just songs for for Jamie and yeah, the Bell project. It's just yeah. sort of hard for me to sort of get in the studio and know what's next mm-hmm. for me. Well, you've done quite a lot of records. So I guess it gets a bit tricky sometimes to it could be that. once you've you've said a bunch of stuff. What do you say next? And if you yeah. currently don't have anything that you feel like saying, you probably are better to just wait until. Yeah, but that's absolutely terrible because I'm a dad. I've got. I've got so much to write about. I mean, I don't know what it is. Maybe it's just, uh, I mean, there's a, cut, there's a few overlapping things. It's more just the fear of, there's a bit of fear in the mix. There's a bit of reluctance to do stuff. Did you have fear before or this is a new fear that you have about what you're supposed to be writing? I don't know. I mean, probably an extension of a, of a classic fear. I mean, like when I met Marky, for example... Like, um, Marky, uh, no, Marky's your main kind of songwriting, buddy. yeah. Marky, Marky, who's Marky, Marky, what's his Marky, what's his name? Marky, 
It's M O C K Y. M O C, and it, that's it. Yeah, it's Mark. just Mark here. Well, yeah, Dominic Salol is his name. Okay, but like we wrote, yeah, we wrote Multiply, Jim, a bunch of shit together, and like you know, he came and basically, basically, uh, where I'm at right now. Yes. With this, although I'm I'm a different person now, and I do keep really busy. But when I met him in Berlin, I was definitely flailing around with a couple of proto songs on a hard drive. And, it, and, and this is when, like, early 2000s? About, yeah, yeah, exactly. I moved to Berlin. This is after Muddling Gear? After Muddling Gear. And I was just sort of like, I'd run out of money. I'd sort of basically burnt through my warp advance. Um, and did they, to Berlin. warp, so they put out Muddling Gear? That was sort of the first... They licensed it from Spymania Records, yeah. So I had, I put it out on Spymania, which is a UK label... That album's fucking crazy. Yeah, it is. I mean, it was definitely, yeah. I mean, uh, you know, that's kind of what I was doing in, in Brighton. You know? Okay. When I started out in, like, 95, to put my first stuff, it was all pre-aggro techno and stuff. And the guy from Spymania, Hardy Finn, was, like, a real legend in the Brighton scene. Like, he always had the coolest shit, and, like, he was into the most raw music... But he introduced me to Dilla, he introduced me to Fela Kuti, you know. Sure. Just the guy who had the hippest record collection. Got to have Just, one of those guys. Yeah, exactly. Yeah. So, absolutely. like, he was that guy for me. Um, and he asked me to do a record for Spy Mania, so I was like, oh, sick. So I get to just go crazy <laughs> and just try to push my mind into the outer limits. Do you know what I mean? Because it's like, I kind of wanted that to be the place where I did it. So what would happen on the extremities? How old are you at this point? Uh, so I probably wrote and made that album in 97, so it's like 24. That's about the time to do your crazy record, I think. Yeah. I, I, I had a band around that period. Definitely the craziest thing I've ever made yeah. was then just <laughs> totally. up for it. Yeah, Completely up for up it. Completely up for and it. Amazing. Like, but it was amazing that with the... Um, I, I, I mean, I guess that was what what initially made me realise I need that kind of person wanting the product. Like, I was making that record for Hardy. Okay. Do you know what I mean? I respected him. He'd asked me. He'd given me his faith in that way. So I was like, oh, I'm going to try to give him this thing because I said I would. Mm -hmm. Do you know what I mean? It yeah, gave me the mental focus to follow through. Whereas with no one asking for anything... Currently... Exactly. Yeah. Uh, and even with Warp asking for a record, it somehow wasn't the same. It was more like just a label at that point. I mean, much as I had a lot of respect for them, it was a bit different. And I just sort of stretched out, just making jams and just kind of not really knowing what I was doing. I was kind of lost at sea, really. So when I met Mocky, he was just like, what you got? Let's have a listen. Because he'd heard me singing on something with our pal Taylor Savvy. We just kind of got together. I don't know how we met, but it's just around in that Kreuzberg scene in Berlin when I lived there. And uh, he's like, oh, who's this singer? And he, he wanted to do something. So we went through what I had on the hard drive. I had versions of songs like Multiply, but they were like like super slow 606 and synth sort of moody right. jams. Right, okay. Just like, like really tripped out things. And he was So like, it wasn't a sort of... The kind of throwbacky soul kind exactly. of not at all no, at that not stage, at all, and, no. and you you hadn't you'd never thought of going in that direction, really. Uh, I wouldn't say never thought of it because I did do a song for Matthew Herbert, a remix of a song that he did, which kind of was in that way, um, okay. and it ended up on the album as and, well. But, you, and, but you'd list, you were listening to this sort of music, or you'd you'd grown up listening to it, or you're, oh, you're, yeah. it was in. Yeah, it's funny that, because it's not like... My, my parents didn't have a good record collection. They didn't have many records at all. Uh, when it came to soul music, it was just literally, I think, bits and bobs I'd heard on mainstream radio. Okay. Which stands to reason, in the UK, all the Brits are obsessed with, you know, soul in a weird way. Mm -hmm. You know, look at, the, look at the way that pop was in the 80s. It was some kind of... You know, it's yeah. all some kind of bastardization of the yeah, great formula of yes, the Motown of era. And yeah. Like, in, to some degree. Just like there's something so tantalizing about beat music that has like, you know, all the things that Barry Gordy knew were, were like kind of 
you know, it's the equivalent of having sugar and salt and fat and food. It just sort of sets you off. It's like, yep. Do you know what I mean? <laughs> the, the, the musical, musical. equivalent yeah. of just like an undeniable beat. Mm-hmm. Do you know what I mean? Crazy, like, vocal work and just catchy-ass melodies and just sort of some of the hallmarks that of Motown sort of found their way into so much music that kind of I invariably kind of would hear as well on the UK radio actual Motown and actual soul. Mm-hmm. But funnily enough, that was probably my only real exposure to it. Yeah, Aside from, like, then later on, like, when I went to college, so I was just deliberately going out finding cool shit on CD and you know what I mean having my Marvin phase and having my all those phases just sort of self-imposed soul moments yeah of course mean? yeah I mean what was your was your voice were you singing when you were younger yeah and it was always in that kind of a, no. a soul style or no 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 that's the thing when I was singing younger I, well when I was singing younger I was just like in, in choirs basically okay. real church boy right English church Yes. Not even church. Didn't really sing in church. Just like the, hymn, the hymns and things like that. Yeah, to an extent. I mean, it was just singing whatever I could, to be honest. Okay. It was more like singing at school and actually more like theatre stuff. Thankfully, in my, I grew up in such a small village. Like, we're talking about a few hundred houses. Wow. You know, it was like a tiny, tiny, tiny place. And that was my whole upbringing was there. And then there's London. So mm-hmm. it's like, you know what I mean? It's only an hour away. <laughs> Yes, and my aunt and uncle, who were so Im- involved in bringing me up, would always put me up. So it was this great thing of me being in an isolated bubble, and then going to London and just going, "Whoa!" You know what I mean? <laughs> yeah, just of course. Especially when you're when you're younger like that, it's just so, yeah. it's so much information, and you want all of it. Totally. I mean, so it was it was it was kind of cool in a weird way. But, um, so yeah, I don't know, singing as a, as a kid, I don't know how it evolved into me. I, I got really into jazz first, and I don't know how. I actually don't know how. Because <laughs> there wasn't much of it around. Who was, so, so who were the kind of people? At peop- school, that's how I got into it. Who Secondary were, school. Marvin Gaye's one you, you mentioned, but y- yeah. younger, who were, the, who were your sort of, who are your guys or your girls? Well, see, like, I mean, obviously, if I look back, basically... Um, my sister's record collection started to get interesting when she hit her teenage years. Yes. You know what I mean? So she's five years older than me. Okay. So when I was about you know, 10, 11, things started to get interesting. So we're talking about 83, she'd start to buy records, which actually was sounding pretty good. It started out with things like U2, uh, but then it, and then she got into like Thompson Twins, Heaven 17, Human League, Prince. Mm-hmm. So Prince was like playing on a regular basis in the house, thanks to my sister. So right. about 1985, of course, Purple Rain hit, I was 12 years old, plus Michael Jackson. So do you know what I mean? It's sort of like the radio was actually pretty decent in the early 80s. Yeah, of course. And, like, so, and then the late 70s, really, when I was, so I was listening to the radio late 70s, early 80s, avidly. Do you know what I mean? I was stuck to the radio. That was my world. And then later on, people like John Peel educated me. And then when I went to college, there was loads of amazing influence that I found from everyone I met. And then secondary school, there was a couple of kids at school that were super involved in wanting to make records and super ambitious. And we used to sit and play music and listen to everything from, you know, the Style Council yeah. to, you know, Prefab Sprout. Um, you know, all the shit that their brothers were listening to. Do you know what I'm saying? It's yeah, a lot to do yeah, with brothers yeah. and sisters passing <laughs> yeah, yeah, down the good course. shit to their kids. That's kind of what happened. Yeah, so looking back, absolutely. that's what happened. It was kind of partly to do with the time. And this is the crazy melting pot that was the 80s in a way. You know, talk about, like, yeah, soul and all that was somehow infused in a lot of that stuff. And Prefab Sprout is in there, but in yeah, a weird definitely, way. Yeah, definitely. Like, Prince, clearly... Once I heard Prince, I was reluctant to want to like Prince because my sister was so into him. And like almost as a rule, I couldn't like anything my sister was into that much. There was an inherent <laughs> rivalry between us. And basically, upon my poor mum, it was just a daily struggle. And uh, yeah, so, but I will say there was a massive turning point for me in 88 when I saw Love Sexy on TV. Wow. And it was like a live show. And I knew all the music. I just knew it all. Because, like, I'd heard it all. Like, we used to listen to Sign of Times, Purple Rain, all that shit. And, like, um, she had all of them on record and cassette and shit. 
It's the golden era of Prince. Yeah, really. and then Love Sexy came on, and I, I remember sort of like looking at TV going, holy shit, this guy can do all this. Like, I didn't know. I didn't know. And at that point, I only listened to Prince. Right. I just, I didn't listen to anything else. <laughs> for a long time. Like, basically for the rest of my secondary school, basically 88 all the way through to about 90. One in the in the Prince K hole. I was in the Prince I, I've, I've major. Been, I've been been there. Yeah, that was it. Yeah, I was living Prince. Wanted to be Prince, playing like yeah. guitar. Yeah, like, wanted to be everything <laughs> yeah, else yeah. And everything. I've, I've been there too. Yeah, so I was all Prince. <laughs> and of course, if you're all Prince, it's a great guy to study because he opens up Sly Stone, he opens up Funkadelic Parliament. I did have Parliament records. When I about when I got 16, I got hip to the local record store, actually had some pretty good shit. I was lucky enough to get Sly Stone, Fresh, got um, Funkadelic, Funkadelic. They had some weird vinyl. There's a few like hippies and shit that would like get the heavy, okay. like stoner funk. Yep, yep, and, like, of course. So I kind of like, it was a lot of drugs actually in my small town. There's a lot of like shrooms and a lot of psychedelics. Oh, the, the good drugs. Yeah, 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 the good drugs. Back in the, yeah, the, the good old days when it, well, there wasn't much available, really. Pills hadn't come out. And then, of course, what happened later in the late 80s, rave hit, and I got swept up in that. Mm-hmm. So basically, you can kind of see it that, now. That all makes perfect sense. I was bored in a small town. Music was everything, in a way, because I had a guitar and I had a few instruments at home. I had nothing else to do, except for computer games were starting to get all right. So I'd do that. And then, you know, between that and going out and, pretending to skate and BMX and all that shit was addictive. Do you know what I mean? So yeah. just, and Electro was a big deal too, man. I remember things like Rocket, Herbie Hancock. Everyone, a lot of people cite that song. I remember hearing that song. Which one? Going, I don't think I know that one. Rocket. Oh, yeah. Oh, that's, that's Herbie Hancock. Right. Yeah. yeah, I know the tune. Like, uh, but when that song came along and Break In and all that was a big deal. Yes. You know... Like, and then, then sort of the early hip-hop and like Grandmaster Flash, and, oh, that shit was kind of filtering through from America, and you heard it. So it's so weird. It was kind of a cool time to be around. There's a lot of stuff in the melting pot, and I just wanted to suck it all in, and I didn't know what to do, how to make music. But Well, it's, it's kind of, yeah, it really sets you up for the rest of your life a little bit, that yeah. those formative years, what you're taking in. Huh? Yeah, and I started on trombone, and I played that as a kid, weirdly. And then, um, so talk about singing. After I heard Prince, I just wanted to be like Prince. Okay. You know, this, this definitely makes yeah. some sense as well. Yeah, that, I just wanted to know he what wail. he was doing. But I was trying to be like Funkadelic, Prince, Sly. Like, I just gravitated to that shit. You know, there was no one at school that liked that stuff. That's why it's a bit weird. It wasn't like I was part of a movement. Everyone was listening to The Cure, like Fields and Nestle, sure, like sure. heavy gothy shit, that the, makes um, sense. the Smiths. You know what I mean? The big thing for, for... I was all white kids where I grew up. All white kids. Mm-hmm. And they just would listen to <laughs> Stone Roses, like indie shit. Yeah, yeah of course. That was the thing. Me listening to Prince, there's like one other kid that liked Prince. I was basically on my own. But I was a loner anyway. So it all made sense. I didn't give a shit. I had like two people that got it and were into music. That was enough for me. And I kind of exist like that still to this day. Yes. I sort of, uh, you know, I'm self-contained. You yeah, know. well, you're Jamie Liddell, you're not at a band. <laughs> it well, does, that's right. It does say, say a lot. That's right. Really, yeah. I, I mean, I enjoy bands to an extent, but I'm very glad I didn't get involved too much in just a band thing because I, it, it just never would have worked for me. But I'm a pretty bad leader, I think, partly. I'm just a bit of a, um, you know, I'm not that way inclined. I don't like bossing people around. Mocky in Berlin, did you say? Mm-hmm. 
Mm. And he kind of what helps you put it put it all together. He's your closer. Definitely a closer, and just sort of like, oh, for example, like you said, what happened to this? Where did this Motown thing come from? It was definitely part of that um, music that did that song. Music will not last. A remix of Matthew Herbert. Okay. Music will not last. Yeah, yeah, that's on um, multiplayer, right? Yeah, it's one yeah of but the... that came first. See, oh, that was a okay. remix I did for him. Ah. Oh. Which was a kind of a cool way of doing it. I took all of the lyrics to the song and like randomized them in the computer. <laughs> like, so that was my idea to do a remix. And then I saw like, you are so rarely, rarely removed. <laughs> Just left to move with these tones misunderstood or something. It's like, it kind of come up some crazy poetry based around the existing words. It's kind of a cool thing. We used to use this program called Mook Poet. Which was an amazing bit of software on the, on the Mac back never in the day. Heard this, this it can, it can like generate it. text on its own. Like we wrote some of the Super Collider lyrics with that, like um, "You Loosen Me Human" stuff. That was generated by a computer. That lyric, <laughs> like you know, just sort of, and you could sort of give it some parameters. Like you could type text and then leave a sort of a blank. You know, uh, wow. would you pay blank for a blank? And then the computer would kind of throw in words there and generate like a hundred lines. Wow. And you could go, wow. Do you still use this thing? Uh, I haven't used it for a while, but it's very good. This, yeah. this is, yeah. I'm, it's excellent. I've, I've been getting a look. You know, when you're doing these pop, these writing sessions all the time, it's really difficult to come up with stuff. Me and David Burrow used to do that all the time. It was very Burrow's sort of cut up styles. But it's amazing just how much intention the brain puts on a relatively meaningless sentence you know we kind of want to make sense of the world around us so if you even you know even if you present it with what seems like utter dada nonsense it's kind of like hmm <laughs> there's something in that though. yeah yeah Do you know what i mean of course we can do, i mean everything I mean, philosophically everything is connected to everything and i think you can say that with certainty there's a way to connect anything with anything else mm -hmm. there's nothing in this universe that you know doesn't adhere to that law as far as i know so you know i mean that being a given we're relatively free in our image painting in terms of like being able to find some way to bring things together yeah. or find a juxtaposition that could be interesting but yeah but that was a good time just and so that's how it started on down the motown road because i kind of did that song like that but then when I had Multiply on the drive and it was this kind of really dystopian, sad, like imploding bit of electro dirge, <laughs> it was really a miserable piece. Marky tried to play it on the guitar and he was like, what's that song? How's it go? So I was like, I don't know, I don't play like instruments anymore. Do you know what I mean? I was like on a full <laughs> electronic one at that point and a bit of a, in a post-rave fallout almost. Okay. And so when he started to play on the guitar, I just laughed at him going, yeah, but we're never going to do it like that because that just sounds like ridiculous. And you know what I mean? I was of like, course, oh, I was very resistant. Yeah. But Marky being quite persuasive and could kind of see it like, well, this got a song here. Like we went and cut it with another friend of mine I was working with in Berlin in the funk house, Daniel Raymond Garn, who played drums on a lot of that record, and was a weird kind of gateway figure for me in Berlin. A German who kind of got me a lot of equipment and gave me a studio and stuff. He was got in a studio one time and knocked out a version of it just so that we could listen to the recording, and that's, that was the one that we, is on the record. Wow, it's right. It's just us like going, oh, we'll go like this. Just like one tape, basically. Did it take you a while to accept it once you Definitely. listen to it you sort of like Definitely. oh it's just a bit whatever yeah first. I was just like it's just too straight up which is funny because when I handed in the record to Warp they kind of had the same reaction to the whole thing they were like what are you doing it sounds just it's not fucked up at all like, this is Warp Records it's not like you know yeah. unwarped so it's like <laughs> you know what I mean so I've unwarped the sound but I was like but by that point I was really proud of the work because things like when I come back around and stuff. That, you know, that song's warped. It is in a way. <laughs> yeah. Oh it, man, it those drum, yeah. all those drum break bits. I mean, it was serious work and it was just sort of like put together on a computer and it was like really, it was, it, funnily enough, as Muddling Gear was really pushing the outer limits, like making multiplayer was really pushing something else. You know, my, me and Mocky's minds are so different. He's coming from a really pure 
musical world. Okay. Harmony and you know, like kind of traditional constructs are really his the center of his of his thinking and of his musical universe. And for me, it was always relatively abstract. And yeah, is, I love this, a good song, like you're saying. Is it still, you're still kind of the same? You I'm not very, I don't have many chops. I can't tell you what chords or what, you know, I've, I've kind of kept myself naive in a way. Um, well, your new record's got some pretty amazing chord changes and ah, things thanks, on man. it. Yeah, but it says that, that's you. It is me, Just yeah. fiddling around. Fiddling around. I can do it with my voice, you see. That's how right. I have to do it. My, I have to do it in monophonically. Okay. So I can't. Th- I can't really do it with a keyboard or a guitar. And then, but then, how do you build those chords? Do you sort of you just sing sing the chord in? Actually, building a beginning, I did do on a guitar. So there's, f- I can kind of play guitar still. Um, I started on guitar, so I'm I'm all right on guitar, and I always forget that I can play it a bit. <laughs> you know what I mean? And I'm not really going to do much on a guitar. It's just going to be bar chords. You know, I might crack out some of my the chords I can remember from school. I can I, all I can remember is like this guy Russell McNamara, who was like all about really crazy chord progressions, and like he was the jazz kid who was like showing me all the ill right. shapes, and I was like, I just learned those shapes from him at the time. Yeah, and that stayed with you forever. I still don't yeah, have any other ones. <laughs> yeah, those, so are, those the are the only ones I got. And I when I played at home, I only did pentatonics. Because kind of from what I could hear from Prince, that's kind of all he did, you know. And pentatonic is still my go-to thing. Mm-hmm. Do you know what I mean? I'm a basic musician, I'm kind of almost like a blues musician, if I think about it. I'm just kind of like, I, I stay in the pentatonic pretty much. I don't have much of a repertoire on any, I I'm a, don't have much of a skill set on any traditional instruments. Hence the sort of mild panic in a white room going, create a track. Right. I usually create it with, very odd parameters, maybe, you know. So anyway, I'm, a, I'm an odd bird in that way, but I can hear a lot with my, with, with, with my voice as the lead instrument. I can kind of... I mean, ha- that's what I did with all the looping shows. It was like yeah, making music know. with my voice. You, you came and played in Melbourne um, after gym, maybe? I came mm-hmm. to the show. I think it was Kimber and I and a few of our other friends. And you had the band, oh, but yeah. then you did a looping bit in the middle, is that right? Yeah, I used to throw a bit in. Yeah, I think you, maybe a few songs there. Because, I mean, I, I started the looping, basically, when I moved to Berlin, I realised I'd scuppered myself, because I spent the Berlin, I spent the warp money, right? <laughs> so I'd screwed myself, I, was, I didn't get that much of an advance, in retrospect, that whole deal was questionable. I mean, nah, I don't know. <laughs> in, in, some, in some ways it was. Um... I signed a long deal. That, five sound, that sounds like a questionable record deal from, yeah, the, yeah, from exactly. the past. Yeah, yeah, yeah. No, I, what? <laughs> You're kidding. Yeah, exactly. But uh, you would think, but yeah, anyway, uh, I signed it though. Yeah, of the, course. The deal was fine. It was, it was me that was maybe questionable. So um, I spent all the money, moved to Berlin thinking, oh, great. Well, now I'm in Berlin. I'm fucked. What am I going to do? <laughs> I, even if I released a record tomorrow, I'd still be skinned. You know what I mean? So I was like, okay, I, I just had to take a brutal look in the mirror and go, what can I do? Because I'd come from this world of really accomplished electronic musicians around in my world, Christian Vogel, you now one of the greatest ever, and like you know, Neil Landstrom and all of the heavyweights that were, that were part of that electronic scene, Cy Begg and sure. like, um, you know, Luke Viber, Square Pusher, Aphex. Like, I knew all those people. That was my crew in a way. Mm-hmm. That were my, they were my peers as well. So I was like, I can't fuck with them. They're way off and way better at doing live shows with electronics than I am. I can't do that. I can't play with drum machines. That's just not my thing. So I was like, oh God, I am screwed. But I said, <laughs> but I can sing. I can use my voice. Like, what can I do? So I basically started to go out with like, and, and Matthew Herbert, thank God I met Matthew Herbert. It's like, so, it's funny enough now, I really come back to just realizing he was such a critical part of my musical upbringing and like freeing up my mind about how a live show could work. I think so we, who, who's Matthew Herbert? Tell us. Matthew Herbert is an absolute legend in the like, electronic music scene in the UK. Uh, you know, he's made music as Wish Mountain, as Herbert, you know, Matthew Herbert, big band. Now right. he's doing a Brexit big band. Like, he's a really <laughs> ambitious guy who's done traditional club music, 
amazing work with loops, um, really ambitious traditional stuff with a swing band and, and like has done incredible performance art. I think now he's the head of the Radiophonic Workshop in the UK. Wow, he's sure. sort of like very well versed. He's done a lot of great collaborations with Danny Siciliano, and uh, I'll have to check his it former out. partner. And like, yeah, he, he's had a really kind of successful and like wide ranging career. Like um, Rosine Murphy, Rosine Murphy did yeah. an album with her, like and, and, and many other things. So, but but seeing his early shows back in the day. Which just really blew my mind because I was like, oh, this guy's up here with a bunch of like boss delay pedals, like old and, school. Yeah, they couldn't do shit those pedals. You yeah. know, you could sort of go, and it was just like a nagging short loop. But I was like, yeah, but it's cool how you can just use that really basic thing. And I, I was working with a guitarist back in my band when I lived in Brighton in the late nineties. My guitarist in the band Balzac that I was part of, you would sit on his own and play his guitar with a looper. Like back in the days when the boss pedals could have a hold and loop, essentially. Yeah, it was pretty exciting. Yeah, and, late 90s. And basic, but yeah. it was, yeah. It, but I loved what he would create. I was like, damn, man. Like, cause he, I love working with guitarists, keyboard players, because they are the ones who know music theory, essentially. Yeah. <laughs> they have to. Yeah, yeah, they're, if they're any good, they know it. So he was really good with that shit. So he knew how to layer and stack something that was really compelling. And I was like, I remember just stumbling in on him doing that, going, "This is really beautiful, man." Like I would really like, I kind of love listening to you doing that. And like you know, it was an it was a naive time in a way. Not many people were doing shows based on looping. It's no, hard to guess, imagine no, that that not. would be a show. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, like that was him just practicing on his own. It was almost a a, a, a necessity for a solo player at that time. Now it's every basket oh, oh, outside of every oh, 100%. supermarket. I mean, it's, yeah. it's almost unbelievable to imagine that that wasn't going on. But um, knowing that I could sort of get involved with looping kind of really helped me. So I put together a show where I had some of the playback from some of the songs I was working on. Mm-hmm. I could sort of do that straight up CD and just sing over it at the front of the stage. Then I'd go behind and build some kind of chaos with some loops and then not try to get on people's nerves too much with too much of that. Do you know what I mean? <laughs> but then later I, I realized that I needed to do more looping, but there wasn't equipment. So I actually gave up music for about six months and just sat in my cabin in Berlin and built software. I uh, learned Max MSP right. on my own and made the looper that bought my house in Nashville, basically. That looper far exceeded anything I did in the recording world. In terms of so you income. made a looper? I made a looper. I didn't know that. Five track looper back in the day when that technology was not available. Uh, yeah, you could record five individual tracks with five individual outputs. I sent that to a Midas console. You can see it on, you can see that looper. Or I did a session where I played live with that looper for years and evolved it and changed it. I uh, started doing that in about and then 2002. What, how, how you, that, you sold the, the idea to someone? Like no. The, no, you just sold it yourself? How, I just would play using, the, using that. Thing. Right. I got kind of, and I, and I just committed to that being my instrument in a way. So if you look at, oh, there's a good YouTube clip of that loop. There's a few, like playing at the Festival Hall. There's like a cool clip with the London Sinfonietta and Squarepush and all those guys Sick. and Plaid and... Uh, I did a big show with it there. I mean, there's not that many on camera. I opened for James Brown using the looper. Bjork, wow. Beck. Um, many folks just using the looper. Um, yeah, there wasn't, a, there wasn't a thing. There wasn't a thing. No one had really done it. No, and it was sort of like forging a sort of a weird path with it. And uh, yeah, it was exciting. It was exciting to crack it out and go, oh, this thing can, this thing can really blow people's minds, man. Yes. It's like it's real time music. I can use my voice. Sick. This is what I want to do. So I'd worked out the formula. Of what can I do? I can build stuff with technology, like the Looper. I love, and I involved a lot of synths in the in the project. So I'd always have an MS twenty or something that I could put my voice through. Thanks to Squarepush, he showed me that trick. And uh, you know, I'd run audio through it, and like 
it, it still, and have a synth and put that in the sampler too, not just vocals. And drum machines came and crept in. I used to have an MPC with me. I had a quite big selection of gear towards the end yeah. on the table. Yeah, I guess you just and, keep uh, adding to yeah, it. Yeah, you? just evolving it. And so, yeah, thankfully that looper came along. Otherwise, I would have just sort of, you know, it's the, it's the um, necessity, mother of invention. Mm -hmm. That was definitely the case for that. Do, do you have a kind of musical ethic at, at all times? Is there some sort of thing that you always believe about what it should be or what you want Goose to do? Goosebumps. Right. That's all I look for. Okay. And like in a live show with the loops, I said I want three moments. I want three moments where Sun Ra would be cool. Uh -huh. Where Sun Ra would have nodded and gone, yes. <laughs> that's it, that's... I wanted to go deep enough where I felt like I could have hung with the real... With a with the real musicians, for me, you know, I mean, mm -hmm. the gods, <laughs> that would have been all right with a couple of moments. Just, you know, what I mean, it's only a glimpse. That's all I ever know I can get in this life <laughs> of music. I'm not connected to the higher zones very often, but I feel like with the looping, every now and again, in my musical career, that's probably the highest I've ever been. It's like a high pressure show where I just have no plan. The initial shows had no plan at all. Wow. It's purely improvised. So like I was just there was no songs, there was nothing. I just would get up on stage and just kinda of go, What have I got? What have I got? Can just start something going. Can do you have you done that recently? I don't know if I'd have the balls That's to do right. it. Yeah, would you be scared to do it now? I feel yeah. like there is sort of a, a, the youthful naivety that totally that can it do was that. very decadent. Yeah. You know what I mean? It was like I realised listening back to those recordings, like people were just often subjected to me, just kind of like, <laughs> like pure like musical narcissism in a way. It's sort of like very masturbatory, but at the same time, at its worst, it was that. At its best, it was really like riding a crazy train and just kind of going at it as with yeah. pure energy. And I think that's what people loved. Was and they were on my side. It's a bit, bit like when I used to go out and see. Because it was inspired by techno, really. It was inspired by seeing people like Jeff Mills and shit. Like, and the way that they were on this thing that was pretty simple. Loopy, you know? Like, but it... And just... But there were... Like, it was always like three turntables or whatever. And it was like... There was always some record clattering away. And they would be fighting to bring it in. But because you could feel the fight, it was so much more exciting than if it was perfectly seamlessly mixed. Yeah, there's something in that tension. Oh, yeah. Definitely. You that need gets to have you that. kind of like, you're grooving and you're just fucking. The crowd are feeling like, yeah, Damn, yeah. this guy is fucking losing his mind up there and really yeah. pushing. They're like invested. Like, I remember like doing things but like that. There's something, dang there's a danger totally. to it. If there's no danger, I think that might be my. Musical ethic yeah. like, is like always need a little bit of danger. It's got to be danger. Yeah, but that that looping shit was super dangerous. Back yeah, in the it's day. terrifying. And a lot of the times I would fall off and like just it was just like it was. I I, I likened it to surfing really. Like you're so looking for a good wave, looking for a good wave. You get a serious wave and you're like woo, and you like you milk <laughs> it, and then you just fall off at some point. Yeah, you know what I mean, I sometimes guess, yeah, there's you, no other way off. Is well, there? sometimes you have this graceful exit, but very rarely. You can sort of think, you know, you even pull off an outro, you know. <laughs> it's like you really are just challenging yourself to just come up with an on-the-spot improvisation. It's jazz, man. Yeah, of course. I was basically that, that jazzing sense. out up there. Yeah. 
I was just kind of like, and you know. Yeah, sometimes. which always makes you a bit of a wanker if you're doing it does. jazz. Yeah, of course. It, yeah, I mean, yeah, but I mean, the thing that stopped it being wanky in a way was that the rhythm ultimately was kind of like techno. Mm -hmm. So there was always something kind of simple at the bed of it that you could kind of ignore the top line, as it were, and just kind of get involved with the uh, with the beat. Mm -hmm. So it was always real rhythm heavy, and like, and in a simple way, it was kind of techno. So it stopped it being just pure free jazz where the drums were wild, the bass was wild. Yeah, you know you've I mean? got something there at least. Yeah, underneath. it's kind of simple music in a way. So the, the wankery was contained. But, but you'll box. never, it's kind of hard to, you won't get genius without that sort of, wank, like you have to push, you right? Do. Yeah. And it's kind of an interesting time now because I think like people, maybe as a reaction to a lot of computer gridded music, I mean, I think that happened to me. Uh, uh, I, I reacted, Multiply was definitely in part a reaction to the sort of boys club of electronic music that I kind of saw going on. Mm -hmm. It all became about faster, louder, harder, more programmed. You know, and in a way, I was just like, hmm, but I'm not feeling anything now. Yeah. It's getting a bit, I can't sing it. I mean, you know, I was kind of, I kind of had a romanticism of an old time that just wasn't there anymore. So I think I did well, want to I, 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 see back. By sort of um, looking at my notes, and I was thinking that, it's like at, at that time when Multiply came out, I, there wasn't, to me anyway, like any kind of like soul, old school artists. I feel like that was one of the first records that was doing that. And then an after that, a whole, a whole bunch more things started to happen, and we, I feel like we almost got inundated. Oh, by we did. It. And then I it was, know, it was uh, like the looping. Yeah. <laughs> so in a weird, yeah. fucked up way. And uh, it's funny. Yeah, I mean... I, I, did, I did sort of almost accidentally kind of ride the front of those two waves. And uh, weirdly, Amy Winehouse was the one people remember doing the soul thing. Yeah. And I guess sort of Ed Sheeran is the one they'll remember doing the looping. And like, you know, it's sort of like, whatever. <laughs> I, I really wasn't about creating a legacy. I was, I was really trying to pay the bills. Yeah. Do you know what I mean? But it's, it's funny to me that, um, and I don't know how, inf how important, like I did interview Mark Ronson recently mm -hmm. and that there was a part of me that wanted to ask him just like, hey man, did you guys hear Multiply? <laughs> did you hear you it? You should have asked him. I know, but I thought it was a bit of like a leading question with my ego at the centre of it, like, I influenced them. You know, it's like, cares. I mean, you know, I think... Or is it just too... So big? I didn't invent fucking, you know, that sound, did I? So it's like, I, at all. I just was kind of revisiting it for my pleasure, really. And, I, I, like, just because I thought it actually framed the songs really well. Yeah. I just thought, oh, this song sounds really good like that. Like, uh, in a way, it, was kind of, it wasn't laziness because, funny enough, Multiply is seen as a sort of an old retro soul record, in a way. But there's not much on it that fits that. You no, know, I think it's city, just... There's like a bunch of weird shit on there. Yeah, I think it's just because it's called Multiply and the song Multiply. Yeah, it's yeah, kind yeah. Of like classic. Yeah, Ed Sheeran did an album, didn't he, with Multiply? Did he? Yeah, the X. Oh, I've not too... Me and Ed Sheeran don't really... We haven't um, yeah. bonded no, musically. I know, I know, fair enough. He... I think he's good though, isn't he? He is good. Yeah. I think that's the thing. As a looper, I have to have, I have full respect for what he does. Right. I haven't even seen him do that. I'm just kind of thinking about his... Live. I don't care about the studio stuff. Right. The studio stuff for me, whatever, I don't care. He just sort of falls into a relatively, uh, in a bag that I, I respect, but it won't find its way onto any playlist no. of mine for my personal pleasure. No. But if I were to see him play live and fall into that gig, I'll be fully there. Because I think it's really compelling and I think he's really good at it. And, like, and it's not easy what he does. He's taking the full risk, even if people don't think he is, he really is. He's doing traditional looping the hard way with no like, electronic gimmickry. Because towards when I started to loop, I got really involved with like, what can you do with looping? What can you do to transform a layer? Like, and I noticed that if you took a sound and say use too much harmonizers or too many effects too early you didn't have the blue collar effect of like this guy worked for that sound I'm hearing right now right. you could just go ooh through a four part harmonizer it's done all the work for you you're not working all of a sudden you just kind of go and it goes 
yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> Do you know what I mean? It's got a delay and a pitch shifter and a thingy, and you just kind of fart into the mic, and it's sort of doing all of this crazy shit. Mm -hmm. It's like you—that's not real looping, for me. I'm more blue collar about it. Yeah. Like that's why Ed is kind of one of the best ever because he just sits there, makes the damn loop, cuts the shit out at the right time, and makes a song with it, and it's just like, and it works. He's a busker. He's a really successful busker. That, that's what his thing was, wasn't yeah. it, initially, right? It was just kind of amazing, and I kind of always have like a basic respect for that because, you know, if I think of music as a gypsy phenomenon in a way. You know, good music has a gypsy edge to me. You know, that's the fire, that's the danger. Flamenco yes. is like, those guys are burning up there for you. Do you know what I mean? Of course. They're breaking their voice almost for you. Like, that broken voice is almost part of the, the tattoos, the scars of like, I fucking live for this shit, man. Do you know what I mean? I've broken so this, my this, voice for this you. Is your, this is what you think. This is your ethic, your kind of musical yeah. philosophy. Is I, yeah, that's, when, uh, that's kind of like part of when the musical gods are smiling down and going, the shit has the, I mean, whatever word you might want to use, soul. I mean, you know, yeah, spirit, it's an easy word. Spirit, yeah. It has who, actual soul. Who are these musical gods? San Ra, Prince, Lee Perry. James Brown. James Brown. Yeah, I mean, there's a lot. There's quite a lot. Fela Kuti, uh, you know, like the ones yeah. where it's just so undeniable. A lot of them are probably not ideal role models as human beings. Probably none of <laughs> yeah, them, actually. No, I don't. Not from the list that you no. <laughs> just described. Do you know what I mean? But they were the, one, they were the wild free thinkers. Yeah. They just sort of needed to live their way to sort of not abide by social norms. Because if you do too much, you're never going to be able do you, to really Do you think you, you sort of could have slipped off the edge and, and killed yourself, vanished? Do you have that kind of no. thing in you? No, it was never going in that direction. No, luckily. You know, not I dangerous really, enough. Thankfully, no. And it's really sad to, to, yeah, to imagine that people yeah, get that low. And I can, I can yeah, this uh, heavy shit, but yeah. And, and uh, a, lot of, but a lot of the big feelers in this world, like, share that stuff with us. And it's kind of hard to, I don't know, sometimes listen to the music of someone who, commit suicide you know what I'm saying I mean that's a really heavy topic but uh, no I don't think it is it's just it's happening all the time at the moment it so it's it's kind of I, nothing to me is heavy it just all is part of the same thing yeah. like we're all, we're all here if we don't talk about it then, then it's it true. kind of it's true I mean uh, yeah some untimely deaths definitely man I've been really hit hard we're really hit hard with Anthony Bourdain and shit you know? right yeah recently of course. And just like, you know, it was funny. We were just watching uh, Parts Unknown the other day and it was just like it used to be in a way. You know, you'd hear his voice and it's sort of like there's such a, there was such an optimism in amongst all of the world-weary knowledge that he was carrying. You know what I mean? There was this generosity to it and you just thought, that's got to like be more powerful than the forces of darkness you know, you want to hope that in the human condition, that kind of optimism will trump, you I know, think the dark we're, we're all, What was, like, Louis C.K. talks about how, what it is that actually, like, prevents people, like, what would be the thing that would push them over the edge to kill themselves? And I think a lot of people, maybe, with this sort of teetering, like, between, on the 50% line, or, like, there's, I'm 60% in for staying alive, pretty much. But, like, if things got 20% worse and I'm sort of at 40%, maybe that would be enough to end it. Yeah, man. I We're mean, sort of trick, like tricked into, you know, I guess because of the way you're, you're brought up or your, your parents, how much they love you and give you and sort of lie to you, basically. You get this idea that you're going to grow up and, and life's going to be wonderful and everything's going to be okay. And then the older you get, the more you realize, like, oh, this is just kind of all it really is. And then you just have to make something of, of, what, of what we have. I'm not uh, sure I agree with the in, implied logic there. Because I, I think the, this is all there really is. It's not something that I would ever claim about the world. Do you know what I'm saying? Yeah, sure. I don't think there's anyone out there that really 
looks at the world deeply. Like you could look at any aspect of nature and just think, oh, that's all they're really... You can no, never... No, you know what I'm saying? I though. don't mean it like... Yeah, I guess I don't But it's mean an it. ignorant perspective that can lead you down that trap of the spiral of like... I don't know what it... Ever, I'm sure everyone's uh, conditions are so different, but uh, I don't know. We'll say Anthony Bourdain is prone to very dark... Uh, passages, but I, I, I kind of thought, think in, in, in my ignorance of his life, it, it's probably influenced by his drink, was influenced by his drinking, you know? Yeah. It's just sort of like the booze is fucking terrible, man. <laughs> but then what drives him to the booze and the Oh, well, sure, in, in but I mean, it could be addiction and it's, I don't know, that's the thing. Yeah. So, I mean, I, th- I just tend to want to blame it on something like that. <laughs> But I don't, I'm just very naive to it. I guess part of my mind doesn't want to think about it too much. Uh, yeah, fair enough. But so you're a happy guy. I, I think I am. I mean, hey, look, I'm not a bucking. It's not Disney. I mean, I'm with you. I'm not like saying that it's like all love and light at all times. I feel the struggle, like everyone, and it's all personal. But um, I can't. I think. I, I think it will be impossible for me not to find a few things I'm grateful for if you know I, could, I can't imagine a time where someone would say what are you grateful for and I'd say nothing of course you know I just I, do, I just would find that idea ludicrous no there's, there's always beauty there's always yeah, there's always magical stuff happening it doesn't that. take much just to kind of put your mind back on gratitude essentially not to get too hippied out but no, at the same no, time course. Uh, I think that's crucial just to sort of every struggle that you're having of course is framed by an inevitable mortality but um, it doesn't and I think maybe sometimes the nihilism that kind of comes from looking at death in a certain way is, is sufficient to justify suicide you know what I'm saying it's kind of like possibly Maybe that's one reason for just sort of not wanting to carry on. It's just sort of thinking it's all ultimately meaningless, which ultimately it will be hard to argue anything else. Yes. It is kind of meaningless, but... That's what I mean when I say like yeah. this is, that's all there is. I see what you mean. So if you zoom out to the, and knowing inevitable death is, is to... And you maybe don't have... A Christian or a religious worldview with an afterlife, for example, if you remove those conditions mm. and you think, I'll die and just be, and my existence will cease to be and I won't have any memory of it, I, in fact, will cease to exist at all. So any talk of that will be irrelevant and so forth. Which I mean, for some people can be really like a great thing. Like, I think oh, it could no, be a relief. In yeah, a re- yeah, exactly. It doesn't matter. So no, I can just I kind think of. In, I, I see in, in some ways. If there's too much noise, I can imagine there being a mindset where there's just so much noise, you know, where you, you just are in these spirals all the time. Yes. And you just kind of want the noise to stop. Well, that's, that's why you drink, you know, for some For reason. sure. Yeah, I've had that a lot. Like, yes, yeah. that's, just want that's that the noise one. To stop. Yeah. If it doesn't stop there and it just keeps coming back more and more and more, yeah. you just think, how else could I stop the noise? Yeah, <laughs> yeah. Well, that's what I mean. How else could I After t- commit? Like my wife was saying something about that. Someone, like she was listening to a program about suicides in Native American society, and like she was saying, like they talked about the word commit with suicide, and I was just thinking, well, there's probably no other word where commit is more potent than suicide <laughs> yeah yeah it's, of all the things you can commit to yeah that's it's, the one it's the ballsiest it's like the ballsiest <laughs> thing you can yeah. do I mean you know and I it's not that I don't understand it it's just like uh, yeah mm. it's just a uh, hey do you <laughs> No, that's of course. Of course not. <laughs> I had a glimpse on it, but yeah, yeah it's uh, going to go on forever. That one. Or, is there a kind of, up. is there a point where you feel like you can sort of hang up your hat and and you're you're done? It's like, is there twenty more albums you need to do? Oh no, like, no, no. no. That's like, I think that's the thing. It's part of the reason why I don't really care in a way about doing more Jamie Liddell shit. Because that's definitely not my. 
but more so, more so than even just as Jamie Liddell, like yeah. you as a kind of artist or as a, as a person. I just love music. And I think I'd need it, I think I've come to terms with the fact that it fills that void for me. Mm-hmm. Whatever, you know, pop psychology levels of clearly I needed something to be a front man, la di da obviously all that stuff is true yeah so i needed attention needed that extra needed that extra and uh now i've got family and, and that world i don't need it in the same way mm-hmm. and so i need but that said um all of that stuff remains in your psyche i think and for me the primal scream therapy of singing is i've come to realize really important for my sanity and making in general it's just good for my state of being. Yeah. Uh, to stop me going into any kind of spiral, like serious or otherwise, it just makes me a better dad, a better partner, a better person to be around if I have the chance to um, get into that zone, make yeah. something. It might be a piece of shit. You know, it's not about it being great at the end. It's just the pure process of making. I just art therapy. In a, in a, in essentially in its, yes in its essence yeah, yeah. And, I, and I'm a big fan of that whole idea a good friend of mine Tim Exile is making a really interesting new paradigm for making music through a company set up called Endless and I've been privy to it because he is a master instrument builder once I stopped using my Max Looper I inspired him in Berlin to build his looper. Right. Not That sounds really cocky. That's basically what happened. I had the looper first. He saw it and thought, fuck, this is a cool way of making music and made a far better looper. <laughs> his looper is incredible. It's insanely good. Like, so once I befriended him, because I heard that looper, I was like, I need that. Man. I need to just play with that thing. It's yeah. so sick. So he gave me a copy of it and I've been using it ever since. Um, I won't use mine anymore. Um, so he started to make that technology available to more people. Uh, and his whole philosophy behind his company is like, music isn't about this great end result and like the masterpiece, for him at least. Mm-hmm. Uh, it's more the therapy of making, essentially doodling. You know, one could say sitting there doodling away is a waste of your life. But it depends. You can be in a beautiful flow state. You're essentially meditating for that time. You're really enjoying what you're doing. You're fully engaged in it. The noise is gone. Mm -hmm. You know what I mean? It's working. It's doing something that's connecting you to some part of you that is, is really what it's all about anyway. So... And sometimes those writing sessions are so far removed from that. That's where this sort of soul-destroying vibe comes from because it's like, yeah. this is all about money. Yeah. This isn't about... And yeah, fame and... Yeah, and, this is yeah. all about that. And, this isn't, and you guys can try and chase it. It might work. It might not. You know, all, you can, all I try to inject into those sessions is like, you know, just try to bring a little bit of a buzz to the, to the idea of making something. That's, I like the sessions because you start with a blank slate and end with something. And as far as I'm concerned, that's the process I like now. Okay. It might not go to a big hit or do anything, but I like just turning up and filling that page. And like, I know that I'm very privileged to get to do that. And especially I know I'm really privileged here in LA for a month. I'm often leaving my wife with our two-year-old and I'm thinking, Dad gets to go off and have his fun therapy time essentially, while mum's at home doing the real shit. And so now I think that I'm seeing that the balance can get very offset and I'm feeling kind of guilty. So uh, it's, just, it's just a constant thing. That's what music is evolving. I'm now a dad and I want to put that at top priority. But part of that is providing. And if I put all of my eggs in using music to provide, I kind of have to balance trying to do more commercial stuff with, with satisfying the itch of just being a creative person that wants to make shit for Sun Ra, you know what I'm saying? <laughs> Are you having the success with the commercial Yeah, I mean, I've had a big song with Hayley Steinfeld. It's now like 415 million streams. So it's like... Nice. Yeah, that'll pay for the year. That'll yeah. pay for the whole year. Great. I mean, it was with a big writing team. Yeah. I say I had a big song, but it really wasn't anything to do it was very much me riding on 
the success of the other writers who were really How many of you writers were on that song? Um, there was four in the actual writing session and then Alesso, this DJ, kind of produced the track out so that in the end it was five even way split. Um, which is which is a fair amount, but for a pop production, I guess it's relatively standard these days. But um, but yeah, so I, I've had a couple of little little tastes. Yeah, enough uh, to keep you going. A couple of Grammy nominations for Muramasa and Leanne Le Havis from the writing and cool. production. Cool. That opens a lot of doors for you once that stuff starts happening, or it's still some a, doors. Still a hustle. It's very much a hustle. Yeah. A part of the 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 experiment of coming to LA was thinking. Does the Haley Steinfeld thing really blow open the doors mm-hmm. and go, hey, this guy's had a, you know, this is in the top 20, this song, you know, this guy is, you can, you can, you can count on him or whatever. Yeah, there's still, I think, you, say, you know, maybe you've had a top five. Right. You know, so it's interesting. I'm just sort of working out, like, what the game is and if I want to play it. Yeah, okay. And how I want to play it, really. Yeah, yeah, it does, take, it does take some time. Yeah, I just, I, I won't chase it too long if it's just feeling like it's killing my soul because you know I'm much I'm all about being less well off and happier I'm not I'm not chasing the money really mm-hmm. but I think if it is out there I'll, I'm, I've got to be responsible as a dad to be quite honest yeah, sure. and just bring home the damn bacon because it's just the right thing to do because I know also how fickle this business is I'm in my mid 40s I don't want to be doing co-writes for the end of time it would be laughable you know if I'd come into a session with a 17 year old and I'm in my fucking 60s or whatever do you know what I mean it'd just be an, it'd just be weird I mean it can still be cool yeah I mean I don't see why that's that fucked anyway actually inherently I don't really care about any of that shit I don't care how young the artist is the artist can be 14 and be a genius you know I'm not going to be like you're too young what do you know or you're too old what do you know I mean I, none of that fundamentally bothers me I guess it's just kind of like you know, trying to make it happen, man. Yeah, I, t- I know. It's the every yeah. day, yeah. every day I'm hustling. Exactly. It's <laughs> just sort of like you know, but also feeling grateful all the time. A lot of great things happened. So got a good team, and yeah, man. Sounds My good. My wife especially. She's the number She's one the on the team. She is amazing. This was one one question I did want to ask you. Yeah. You have some very intense, deep love songs. Yeah. And I think they're about her. Mm-hmm. For the most part, definitely. Um, I was listening to Alain de Botton, that English writer, that kind of love philosopher, last night talking about, um, you know, how films and songs have kind of given us a false idea of what love really is. Mm. And I wanted to ask you how sort of true those lyrics are, or if some of them are kind of just based on like throwback ideas of love songs, or if you really. You really mean it. Yeah, no, I do really mean it. And I think it's sort of, it's, it, it, yeah, and I, I understand. I think for some people saying things so blatantly is just sort of, you know, frowned upon almost because it's just not seen as, a, as, as that creative. But at the same time, I, I just find that it's also relatively hard just to sort of be really clear and you know just say this is really this is it you know I, I, I just feel like it was a bigger risk for me to be just really honest you know or just to be like really clear with it and not dress it up and not mm-hmm. say like I love the way you take a shit you know <laughs> and just kind of like that be the clever way of framing almost a Bukowski-esque you know what I mean? Like, sure, I love everything about you, even, you know, the smear of shit on the toilet bowl. <laughs> you know what I mean? Like, that's real love. And sure, I mean, that's the maybe, if you could frame that, it could be deeper in a weird, more poetic way. I just feel like sometimes I, in my life, have been very abstract. Look at multiple, look at, you know, muddling gear and shit. I have a tendency to want to, like, do the absolute opposite of just blatantly saying, like, mm-hmm. I love love you for everything and thank you and like it's so clean and to the to the point did it take you guess, to it? for some people like a hallmark kind of card I guess is like your point but at the same time I, I, for me just personally it's important I've come from a family an English family everything is behind the scenes no one says I love you there's 
There's no verbal outward encouragement. Do you know what I mean? And yeah. I don't want that for my son. I, I want a world of really clear love. Of really, and I feel like that's positive and it goes against my upbringing and it's hard for me to do it, actually. Well, then that's, so, so you're, then you're pushing. It's my personal yeah. thing. And also it's something that I genuinely feel. So it's, it's yeah. But I, feel, I know exactly what you're talking about. And, uh, but that's, that's funny that yeah, for you to do that is you actually yeah, pushing hard. It actually it's is. like it's struggle to do yeah. that. I actually have so to really fight to go. Yeah. I really just be so clear. I want to be. Do you know what I mean? There's, a part, there's just a part of me that just everyone wants to be loved. Everyone, want, yeah, everyone, you know, everyone needs to know that they're loved. And it's just, if you don't agree with that, you're just mean. Mm-hmm. Do you know what I mean? And I think. In a, music isn't about being clever all the time it's actually hard just to you know I didn't like used to like I just called to say I love you by Stevie I would never listen to that shit but now as you get older and a little more sentimental I understand it yeah, yeah I think that, I understand that's also it. I'm that. not going to turn it off I'll be like there'll be a smile man being a dad it's like I hope my son does that to me do you yeah. know what I'm saying yeah fucking right I do do you know what I mean? I'd be cool if he said, I'd just cool to say I love you. I'd be like, damn, man, that's, that's gonna, <laughs> it's gonna like, you know, do it for me. So anyway, it's true. I don't care about being sentimental sometimes. It's all good, man. Thank you, Jamie. My really, pleasure. really appreciate it. Thanks for letting me ramble on. Hey, man. love it. That's what it's all about. <laughs> Thanks, man. Cheers, dude. That was a real treat to sit down with Jamie. Thank you so much, Jamie, for taking the time. I've been a fan for uh, yeah for ages, so it was such a such a joy to be able to ask him all those questions, see where his head's at, see what he thinks about everything, get to the bottom of it, get to the bottom of Jamie Liddell. I don't think like we've got to the bottom of it at all. I think there's plenty more that he has inside, plenty more that he has to come. He's got so many. He seems like he just oozes oozes the music juice. I don't know. He's got he's got the thing. If you watch some of the, I put some live videos and a bunch of links on the you can see it on the podcast app i've got some links there to his a red bull music academy talk that he does and a performance that he mentioned at festival hall in london in 2004 you can see that he's just he he can just go he's just got the the energy the music inside of him and it just flows out he's not afraid and i think that's what's so special about jamie he's also got his new record building a beginning check out that the title track from that which is great there's a song walk right back and another song i stay inside which i think are really cool also there's a link to a playlist of my favorite you know kind of like my, my personal greatest hits but it's you know just there's still other songs that he has that are awesome but just some ones that i think would get you into jamie if you haven't heard any of his music so check that out and also there's his podcast hanging out with audio files which has some very heavy hitters on there i listened to an interview with mark ronson which was really cool he's had kimbra chris taylor probably you know we've had a bit of crossover in some of the guests there we have so yeah check that out also yeah i think that'll do us for today thank you so much for tuning in another episode of the bottom of it appreciate it i'll be back within the next few weeks i think it's going to be every two weeks from now on i'm going to stick to that schedule keep things regular so thanks again see you soon